Minister in love on him, so well done, well done, so good. All right, I got two testimonies to read from you. So these came in uh, in the last seven days here. Um, let's see. So this was a, uh, at, a, at a service, it was outside here. Um, Jim, you called out a total knee replacement right knee, so it's a word of knowledge. Person said, I had a total knee replacement in April in my left knee. I was scheduled for a total knee replacement in my right knee for September 13th. A lady went forward, so I just prayed at my seat for my knee and received. Since that night, I have had no pain. So this is almost three months later. I've had no pain, so I'm, I'm so convinced that I canceled my surgery. I have camped, kayaked, and even hiked for an hour with my hubbins. With no pain in that right leg, just wanted to give testimony to the goodness of God over my knee. Yeah, so good. There's another one. I've been dealing with severe back issues since 2017. Last year, I ended up having a four-level spinal fusion. That went well until early this year. Severe and debilitating pain hit. I had shots and nerve ablations to no avail. I had allowed myself to get to a place where I thought that God had forgotten me until today. When I saw your video this morning, so I guess they must have watched something on YouTube, a voice inside spoke to me. It was my turn. That's good. The pain stopped. I was very cautious at first, but shared my healing with my wife. My back is tired. I've been going all day. I still have no pain. I can't thank the Lord enough. He emailed me the next day and said uh, he did uh, Christmas tree and Christmas decorations the whole day, no pain. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good news. So we're in a series. We are in part 11. You're like, Jim, you're only doing 11 parts? Don't worry. We just did nine parts on healing before this. So it's actually part 20, but uh, part 11 of a series called Heal Like Jesus. And what we're doing for this series is we're going through the 26 individual healing stories of Jesus. Of course, there was many more stories in the crowds, and, uh, and it said there were so many miracles he did that if all the books in the world were to be written of all the things he did, the world couldn't contain them. So this, isn't, this is a small sampling of what Jesus had done. And so today we're going to be looking at the story of the man with the withered hand, and we're not looking at it to like learn some, in, you know, some interesting things about healing. We're looking over the shoulders of Jesus to see how he healed, because that's how the disciples learned to heal the sick. And when they learned to heal the sick like Jesus, it said they turned the world upside down for Jesus. And so part of the gospel includes the gospel of power. Amen. It's not gospel to just have words. Paul said, listen, I didn't come to you with wise and persuasive words. I came to you with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that's what we're after. And so as a church, we are going after this. And uh, I'm hoping that, you know, you know, here we are week 11, week 20 for some of you. We're starting to get it. We're starting to get that God wants you well. Yeah. That's right. That uh, God good, devil bad. Healing, good, sickness, bad. Yes. All right, we're starting to get it. All right, good, good, good. All right, so let's turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at this story in all three Gospels here. So I'm just going to go ahead and read Matthew 12, 9 through 13 is the first of them. He, being Jesus, went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? Jesus said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went and celebrated and said, how can we become some of your disciples? No, no, it's not this side. <laughs> but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Well, religion's ugly. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue. This is the same story from different perspectives. Again, he entered the synagogue. I want you to notice the differences. And a man, with a, with, a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save or to kill, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked at them, looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians. These are people they should have been collaborating with, against him, how to destroy him. Let's read it again in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 6, 6 through 11. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. Luke's the doctor. He likes to give more details. He's the only one who says it was his right hand. Uh, verse 7, And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so they might find a reason to accuse him. Verse 8, But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. 
And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them, at, at them all, he said to them, stretch out your hand. I mean, just look at the drama of this. I mean, there is this tense debate here. I mean, they're silent, they're in stunned silence. Jesus is just looking around and he just, uh, just nails it. And after looking around at them, and at them all, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, but they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Whoo-wee, I got some good ones here. Do you guys notice some differences there? between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So these aren't contradictions. These are three people uh, sharing three different perspectives on the same story. And so what I want you to get out of this story is how Jesus responds to this religious doctrine that they're saying, you know, like Jesus, you know, the God shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. How Jesus responds. I want you to catch how Jesus feels, how deeply he feels about you being healed. His compassion, his heart over you. I want, I want to settle this once and for all so you will never ask again. And so um, the healing of your body, your soul, your emotions, your mind, your finances, all that stuff. Listen, because when I know how much God cares about me and how much he wants me well, it's easy for me to believe. So uh, here's what Galatians says, faith works by love. So if you're having a difficult time believing, you don't have a faith problem, you have a love problem. And when you understand the love of God, it's super easy to believe. Listen, when you believe that your parents um, love you and want to do good things for you, it's not super hard to believe what they say especially if they've kept their word forever and have never lied and never let you down, okay? We gotta, we gotta catch the same thing. Jesus is constantly comparing. Hey, if an earthly father would do this, how much more the heavenly father, okay? And so this is where we're going. And so uh, we, to know how deeply Jesus cares for you concerning your healing. This is what happened to me. I had uh, stomach issues that were similar to Crohn's disease for years and um, it, it was getting bad. I don't wanna give too much detail here, but I lost about 25 pounds through diarrhea. And so I was gonna write a book called How to Lose Weight Without Diet or Exercise, but I didn't think people would like to find out that the <laughs> secret solution was disease, you know? And so uh, we had Brian Simmons in a couple years ago, and Brian was teaching on the Song of Songs, and it was just a revelation after revelation of how much God loves you. It was just his vision for us being the bride of Christ and this love affair between God and man. And it was like I was just being washed by God's love. It was like I knew God loved me. I've taught on it all, you know, most of my life, and, uh, but this was just a new revelation of it. And at the end of it, Brian uh, started calling out some words of knowledge. And one of the things he said was Crohn's disease. I'm like, I don't have that, but close enough. So I raised my hand and I stood in faith for it. I received it. And that day on, I've never had any symptoms. Yeah, yay God. So it wasn't necessarily a faith problem, it was a love problem. When I realized the love of God, that it was for me, that I didn't have to perform, I didn't have to improve, I didn't have to get rid of some things, I have to pull something down or push something up and all these other things. So, all right, let's look at the context for this miracle. Matthew chapter 12, verse nine. Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue. Now the synagogue was a place for teaching and instruction. There was a synagogue ruler or leader, but there wasn't like a professional preacher there. And so the, the synagogue ruler would appoint someone who was competent to teach. That's why you would see Jesus and the disciples, whenever they would travel to a synagogue, they always had a place to preach because they were, they were able to do that. And so uh, let's get the picture of a Sabbath servant, okay? So imagine we've we got a time travel machine. We're going back to the first century, and there you are sitting in a Sabbath service in ancient Israel. All right, so you're uh, surrounded by simple peasants, fishermen. Uh, the place probably felt like, smelled like fish. Um, you know, they, they couldn't get that smell off of them. They were around it all day long. So you got farmers, you got fishermen, you got peasants around you. But up front, there's a bunch of overgrown schoolboys called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees uh, comes from the Hebrew word meaning separate ones, separated ones, okay? And the title was appropriate because they basically separated themselves from all life so they could devote themselves to being super religious, okay? They declared themselves as super spiritual and they love to show it in public. Jesus tells us all about these kind of things, okay? And they're gonna show you how spiritual they are because anything that the Jews did spiritually, they were gonna do it to the nth degree, okay? And so in the days of Jesus, the men wore prayer shawls. They had those tassels on the end that we talked about them. They would have wore it over the shoulder. And there was a certain length of the tassels, but the Pharisees doubled the length of those tassels to show you that their prayers were twice as powerful as everybody else's. <clears throat> uh, you must all know um, when ordinary uh, Jew Jewish uh, peasant prayed, they would tie a little box around their forehead. There's a part in Deuteronomy 6 that says, bind the, uh, talking about the word of God, bind it to your forehead, tie it to your wrist. So when they would pray, they would tie this little box in their foreheads, they would put it on their arm, and they, would say, and they would put it on their heart, and they would say, God, into my mind and in my heart, I'm carrying your word. Just a powerful reminder. 
And so the Pharisees, they didn't just wear it when they prayed, they wore it all the time, right? They're just letting everybody else know. We are praying nonstop right now, don't interrupt me, right? And so uh, I doubt they were praying all the time. But not only did they wear it all the time, they tripled the size of it. So it looked like they had like this giant unicorn head, you know, going wherever they go. And they would uh, exaggerate their prayer movements. And so if a Jew bowed their head, they would bow their head all the way down and rock all the way back and forth. They just, you know, their, their prayers were so much more, everything was so much more, right? Uh, they fought for the seats up front, right? They didn't want to sit in the back with the peasants. They wanted to be in the places that were, was important. So you can just see these spiritual men with their exaggerated clothing elbowing each other to try to get the front seat while the peasants sat in back. You guys get in the picture? And when it came to the Sabbath, um, the Hebrews were different than anyone else in the nation because they only worked six days a week. All the other nations worked seven days a week, right? And so um, when Mary and I were in Israel recently, did I tell you guys Mary and I went to Israel recently? I'm not sure if I brought that up. But when we were just in Israel, uh, it was funny because... We're going to use the elevators there. On, uh, you know, we didn't realize you know, it's Sabbath. You know, so Friday night, 6 o'clock, Saturday night, 6 o'clock, Sabbath. And so they have Sabbath elevators, and they considered it doing work to push a button on, on, the, um, on, the, on the thing. So you just, we, I mean, we kind of figured this out by default. You get in the elevator, and it stops every floor. And so, like, like you know, you could be the only one in there, and you're on floor 14, but you're out two, three. Why? Because it's considered work to push the button. They have Sabbath electricity there. We were not aware of this either. And so um, they had a special button. We could have opted out of it. We did not know this. And so wherever, when it hits Friday at 6 o'clock, this is an ancient Israel. This is today's Israel. So you can just get a picture of this, right? And it's because Mary and I were just there. And so, um, so Friday at 6 o'clock, whatever electricity you have on, it gets locked on there because it's considered work to turn on a, a light switch or to turn off a light switch. And so when we got to our room, it was like Friday, you know, afternoon and our room is like roasting so we put it on like 60 degrees and so um and then we were like went out to dinner and we came back and we're like we, we we can't get the air to go down and so it was 60 degrees in our room from friday at six o'clock to saturday at six o'clock so we're yeah and so that, that's what they had going on there and so still to this day i mean uh you know friday six o'clock most of the shops closed down i mean like you better find something to eat before that time otherwise you're gonna have to go to like the palestinian place or something like that and so the immediate neighbors, they all thought, like, who can afford to only work six days a week? These Hebrews are crazy. But here's what it was. It was supposed to be a gift from the Lord. And God was saying, listen, if you'll trust me with those six days, you'll get more done in those six days than you will in, the se in seven days of work. It was to be a day of refreshing. It was to be a day of renewal where they could uh, cease from their labors. It was actually a picture of salvation where uh, we, we can cease from our labors because everything has already been done. The work of salvation has been done for us in Jesus. We enter into his rest, right? But back then it was a physical rest. They could actually physically enjoy a day. And so we went from something that was to be a blessing from man, and then the Pharisees get a hold of it, and they're like, no, 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 no. This, uh, we, got, we got to put some rules around this. So the Pharisees loved the law, and so, but they did something what they called fence laws. And so you had a law, but they're like, you know what, let's make sure we don't even come close to breaking that law. So put a whole bunch of laws around it like a fence. You see Satan do the same in the garden. Remember God said, um, you may eat, freely eat of any uh, tree in the garden except for this one. And what did Satan say? What did God say? You can't eat of any tree or touch it. God didn't say you couldn't touch it. Satan begins these fence laws, and the Pharisees pick up on this. So the Pharisees said things like this. We've talked about this before. They said that if you pick up a pin off of the floor, that's doing work because you're moving steel on the Sabbath, right? If you look in the mirror and see a gray hair, and you were to pluck it out, you're doing the work of a hairdresser that you've broken the Sabbath and you've committed sin. How are we doing? And so you can, I mean, they just had so many crazy things about whether you were able to, um, you couldn't knead dough on the Sabbath, which is funny because one of Jesus' healings, he actually kneads the mud. You know, he, he's, Jesus did lots of things for them, just, just, just for them, lots of things just for them. And you got to imagine that they couldn't even enjoy the Sabbath. What was supposed to be a gift for man, now they're like, did I walk too far? I had something sticking in my, in myself, in my jacket, and I pulled it out. Is that doing work? And so... You know, then they come to the end of the day of the Sabbath and they know they've probably done something wrong. And so instead of being refreshed and renewed, now they're feeling guilty. It's this heavy burden that had been placed on them. Are you guys getting the picture? The scribes taught very plainly that uh, you are to heal nobody on the Sabbath. You were allowed to put a gauze on somebody, but if you put medicine on the gauze, you couldn't do that. The only time you can act as a doctor on the Sabbath is if someone's about to die. If they're just suffering, it's too bad. They've got to wait till Saturday at 6.01. This was literally their teaching. 
Uh, you can keep them alive until the Sabbath is over. Then you can try to save their life. All right? So you get the idea about how these men felt, felt about Jesus. Jesus, he begins to get a reputation. This guy's a Sabbath breaker. He doesn't care about the law. No, he doesn't care about your man-made rules. Jesus never broke the Sabbath. So he's got this reputation. He's going around the country healing people on the Sabbath, which their little rule book says you can't heal on the Sabbath. You've got to wait till 6.01 on Saturday. And so you're like, why couldn't Jesus just leave these people alone for a few more hours? Because he doesn't care about your religious rules. He cares about the heart of God being released. So Jesus, he's going around healing people on the Sabbath day, and then he's got the gall to have them do work on the Sabbath. Take up your mat and walk. There was actually a specific, I think there was like 39 or 41 different rules, and the very last one involved carrying your bed on the Sabbath day. It's like, Jesus, you're just, you could have just held it together. You, could have been elected like an official or something. I mean, you know. And so, uh, but not Jesus. And so, uh, Jesus, he's revealing the true meaning of the Sabbath, the shalom of God to come upon people. And so, um, so you can see Jesus. He's seated on the platform. Jewish teachers, they sat down when they teach. And he's met by the eyes of these venomous snakes. The, 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 these religious eyes are looking at him. And they're watching every single word he said so they can accuse him and bring it before the religious tribunal and try to destroy everything about him. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 10. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So these are the Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees. Is it lawful? They begin to debate him on this. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? So it's more than a trick question. Okay? And so uh, remember, the, this, the uh, Pharisee, uh, the scribes already had a law. You cannot heal on the Sabbath day. They're basically saying, come on, we've heard you've been teaching on the Sabbath day. We've got a rule against this. Let's hear it for ourselves. Let's, let's, let's get some evidence on this guy. So they're playing attorney, but the problem is they're also playing judge, jury, and executioner on this one. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus does something so brilliant. He pulls out a scripture from the Old Testament, the very law that they had written on their unicorn boxes, right on their arms. He, I mean, he basically could have walked over to them and pulled it out and said, here you go, right here, right? And Jesus pulls it out. Matthew chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said to them, which one of you who has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Oh man, he's just using some incredible logic on them here. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He gives them the conclusion. Doesn't just give them the scripture, give them the conclusion. Guys, if, I could, if we could just stay with Jesus and get rid of all this other religious junk, I think we're going to get set free today. Okay, let's, let's just unpack this a little bit. If you and I can get God's heart for people, we won't question if it's the will of God to heal. Why? Because when we doubt his willingness, we doubt whether or not he's going to do it. I mean, it just totally undermines faith. I don't know if God's going to do it. Maybe he's got a higher purpose. Maybe it's sovereign. You know, um, maybe he's teaching me some important lesson. Maybe it's making me more like Jesus. Religious garbage. All of it. Okay? Jesus made it simple. The enemy likes to make it complex and confusing. All right? So he asked, uh, so he asked him, uh, what about you? If you've got a sheep on the Sabbath day, can you imagine these guys just sitting there just burning? Because it's like a duh question. If you've got a sheep on the Sabbath day and it falls into a ditch, are you going to do anything about it? And if they were honest, they knew they would. And if they were honest, they knew that they had. So why is Jesus bringing it up? Because it answers their question. He's saying, listen, if, you got a, if you'd help a sheep, God's going to help his kids who are worth more than a sheep. I, I, like, like, catch this, guys. All right, we're, we're going to pack it here a little bit. So um, it's no different. Me, Jesus healing on the Sabbath, God healing somebody is no different than helping a sheep out of a ditch. Of course you would. You see someone hurting? Of course you're going to go over there and help them out. You see somebody sick? Of course you're going to heal them. This is how God sees things. It's sad. America has millions of church-going people who have opened their Bibles today, read out loud, sang services, gave them the offerings, they might believe it might not be God's will to heal them for any number of religious reasons. And yet they've got a pet. And if that pet were to hurt itself, they would be more than happy to help that pet out. They wouldn't say, Father, should, should we do something about this pet? I remember um, our little, uh, my little Ellie, my little Alejandra, my little baby princess. I remember we're on vacation uh, at the beach and we took her for a walk and she got covered in burrs, like these little spiky balls, right? And so we didn't say, Father, what lesson are you teaching our dog through this, you know? And not, not to enter into the bird patch or, you know, that she shouldn't have gone potty on the carpet. You know, like, like are you teaching her? Like, no, no, no. Like, our heart was broken. Like, oh, my gosh, our dog is hurting here. And we're taking her back. And luckily, our niece had worked at a groomer's, and so she's picking him out, and we're all feeling horrible. That was the natural response when you see something that you love hurting. 
And God's like, this is how it is, y'all. If you see something hurting, you help it. This is the heart of God. And you're much more valuable than a hurting dog with a burr, than a hurting sheep in a ditch. And yet people come to church and decide that we are better and we are more kind to animals than God is to people. I don't want to see this animal suffer, but God has a higher purpose to see human beings suffer. How stupid can you get and still breathe? Does God hold us to a different standard than himself? Remember the story of the Old Testament about Balaam, what happened to him? Balaam, Numbers 22. Balaam's riding his donkey, and he's going somewhere he shouldn't be going to do something he shouldn't be doing. But there's a whole bunch of money involved, and he wants the money. Right? So he saddled up his donkey, and he's riding there. And an angel of the Lord manifests in front of the donkey, but uh, Balaam doesn't see it. So the donkey begins to uh, back up. So what does Balaam do? He starts beating his donkey and, uh, and, and yelling at the donkey. The donkey backs up some more, beats him again. Um, the donkey uh, walks over, it must have been something like a wall, smushes Balaam's foot in there. Now Balaam's really beating the donkey. And then the eyes of Balaam are opened up and he sees this angel of the Lord there with a sword. You guys remember this? Numbers 22, 32. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Why? Is it bad to beat donkeys? Apparently so. It must be bad in the sight of God to be abusive and cruel to animals. Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you, but I would have let her live. I love that. You are about to be toast, but the way you're treating this donkey, I would have let this donkey live, but not you. Okay, I want you guys to get this. I mean, can you imagine, because the donkey, remember, God gave him supernatural uh, voice to be able to speak. I'm sure the donkey was like, "Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. You've been beating me here. Yeah. Trying to save your life. Now, if God's so disconnected with his creation, he doesn't care about their suffering. He's just up there callous and teaching them lessons with, with all of this sickness. Then you wouldn't see anything like this. The angel actually brings up the donkey. God's actually concerned about the donkey. Why are you beating this donkey? God is concerned about it. God cares about donkeys. God cares about sheep. He's like, listen, this is what any normal human shepherd would do. If he's got 99 sheep and one of them's lost, he's going to leave the 99 to go find the lost. Why? Because that's the heart of any shepherd. He's like saying, this is reflecting of the heart of God. God cares about birds. Matthew 6, 26, look to the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? How do most people try to get their needs met? Sowing and reaping or hoarding? Look at the birds there. They neither sow nor reap. I gotta, if you got a need, you sow a seed. Just because it rhymes doesn't mean it supersedes Scripture. God's not going to provide for you because you perform on the offering plate. He's going to provide for you because he loves you more than birds. I'm not saying sowing and reaping isn't a biblical principle, but that's to increase your harvest of righteousness, not to get your needs met. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in a barn. And so many people, they're going to you know, get all they can, can all they get, and sit on the can. And they're going to hoard as much as they can. And that's how they, and God's like, this isn't how it works in the kingdom. Why? Because he loves you more than birds. So are you more valuable than a donkey? More than a sheep? More than a sparrow? Let's read it again, Matthew 12, 11. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of course they would. Any normal human being who loves their pet, who loves something, is going to act on it. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? How much is a man worth? Well, value is determined by what someone's willing to pay for it. You are worth the blood of God. I'll tell you what, I don't love you enough to have my son shed blood for you. But there's a supernatural kind of love where God is like, I want you to know how committed I am to you. So the blood of God was shed to make a covenant so you would never doubt his heart again. Guys, I'm hoping that in this series we will never doubt the heart of God again. I remember uh, my Wesley, my Lord Van Wesselheimer, my my second son. We were uh, were on staff at this church and there was, uh, we owned this other building, it was like this house, it was this backyard and the kids were back there playing in the rocks and throwing some rocks and they dug up a yellow jacket's nest. They didn't know what they were playing with their rocks. Yellow jackets are the suicide bombers of the insect kingdom. There's nothing, I, I don't, I, when I get to heaven, I'm like, God, why the yellow jackets? Like, there, there's, there's nothing redeeming about the yellow jackets, right? And so, um, and so he's in there, and so the, the nest, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm probably, I don't know, 30, 40 feet away. 
And I hear him screaming, and I look, and he's being swarmed by these things. They're just biting him all over. I didn't say, Father, please teach Wesley a lesson (laughs) about yellow jackets' nests. Would you give him wisdom and insight and show him how spiritually this is somehow applied? No, 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 no. Without thinking. Like, guys, if you were to like, say Jim's five, top five characteristics, probably one of them is not bravery. I'm just going to be honest. It's not like, Jim, he's so brave. You know, he just, he just danger means nothing to him. No, that's not true. And so um, without even thinking, suddenly, I mean, I, I was like I went into the phone booth and just shot out there and uh, scooped him up and began taking the bites, swatting the things off him and, and got him out of there. Why? Because I love my boy. And I would do anything to see him well. If you fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the Heavenly Father? Guys, if you ever want to know the heart of God, just think about what a halfway decent parent would do. Look around here. we got lots of great parents. Just pick one. What this parent would do, God's going to say, that's how much more I'm going to do than you. The response of any human is not going to be anything close to the response of God. If I put sickness on my children, I'd be arrested for child abuse. And to think that God the Father is putting sickness on his kids is deeply disturbing. God does not cause sickness. God does not allow sickness. The church allows sickness. He put a gun in your hand and told you to shoot it. He said, I give you authority over every sickness, every evil disease, every evil spirit. But Jim, God is sovereign. Yes, and he sovereignly chose to give you authority over every sickness, every evil spirit, and every disease. So Jesus asked him this question, but these, uh, these Pharisees, they consider themselves to be the shepherds of Israel. These shepherds of Israel, they're saying, you can't go pick up the sheep, even though every good shepherd would be able to. Mark 3, 4, and Jesus said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And you can just see them sitting there in silence, just burning. The word there in the Greek implies they sat in silence for a long time. So Jesus, he just lays this, this analogy on them. You know, a shepherd, a sheep. And they consider themselves the shepherds of Israel. And God actually rebuked the um, shepherds of Israel who would not heal the sick. Are you guys ready for this? I mean, this is the law that they love, and they're overlooking these things. Ezekiel 34. If Jim's bringing up Ezekiel, I just referred to myself in the third person. If Jim's referring to himself in the third person and uh, referring to Ezekiel, you know this is going to be good. <laughs> As you go 34, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord, ah, shepherds of Israel who've been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep? The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. God's rebuking uh, the overseers of his people. One of the things he rebukes them of is the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up. Now listen, guys. God is rebuking them for not healing. He is the good shepherd. He is not going to rebuke somebody for something that he's not going to do. God can't say, I'm rebuking you for not healing the sick, but I'm not going to heal the sick because I've got all these religious reasons why. The pastors that are teaching you God does not want to heal the sick, the Lord rebukes them. Amen. And he says, you're a false shepherd. You're feeding the sheep. You're feeding yourself. Feed the sheep. If that, if that pastor is sick, I guarantee they would go to the hospital. They wouldn't say, oh, I'm sick for God's reason. Lord, double portion. Now I have pneumonia. Let it be double pneumonia. <laughs> They're not saying that. And yet they're telling you, you can't be healed, but they want to get well. They're saying God doesn't want you well, and yet God's saying, hold on, I rebuked the shepherds who said do not heal, and he himself is the good shepherd. He can't rebuke his under-shepherds for not getting the sick healed, and then himself not heal people as the good shepherd. It cannot be. Are we okay? Guys, this is why the Psalm 23 is so beautiful. It talks about the shepherd. It describes our good shepherd today. It's not just like, oh, this is what shepherds are like. No, no. This is what our shepherd is like today. He leads us beside still waters. He guides and protects us with his rod and staff. He prepares the table for us. You can see provision. You can see protection. You can see health all in there. He was the good shepherd back then, and he never changes. 
So just in case you didn't get it, Jesus is like, listen, the value of a human being is so vast that even if a sheep was in a pit, you'd get it. Human beings are so much more valuable. If, you're, if you've ever had a child that's been sick, there's nothing in you that's like, hmm, good. Like, uh, yeah, I, I was hoping this would happen because this would be some teachable moments for them while they're laying there with a fever. Like, that's disgusting. No, no parent would think that. Just, just think about a time when someone that you love has been hurting and your heart goes out. God's saying, that's the heart of me. Except the thing is, guys, that's, it's not just sympathy. Sympathy feels bad for you. The compassion of God is holy love mixed with holy anger. It's that holy anger, like, this isn't right. This is a result of what Satan has brought into this world, that that holy anger gets you there, and that holy love brings you out. That's compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion. It wasn't moved with sympathy. Ooh, oh, that's got to be terrible. You can even hear it when someone describes a disease. Ooh, people just begin to say out loud, bless you. Begin to say out loud. Sorry, I recognize that sneeze. That was a princess sneeze. That was my wife. I, I know that sneeze. I could pick that sneeze out of a thousand sneezes in a crowd. My heart was moved with compassion. God bless you. Mark 3, 3, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. Now imagine, you're sitting in the back with the peasants. There's this debate going on. And the peasants, they're half scared of the Pharisees anyway. They're intimidating. They're walking around with these sour looks in their faces, just spilling out rules on anybody. And here's Jesus. He's not taking it from these guys. He's giving it right back to them. So there's this tense atmosphere. They're sitting in the back. And all of a sudden, Jesus electrifies the crowd and tells the guy with the withered hand to stand up and come here. I think in Luke, it's, it's, it, the picture is Jesus sitting down. Everyone's in a circle. They talk with in a circle around him. And now here's this guy standing in front of everybody. Okay. As so you can see, this guy, he slowly gets to his feet. Every eye is on him, right? But the Pharisees, they're kind of watching this guy, but they're watching Jesus even more to see what he's going to do. And his right hand is just hanging there. It's dead. It's useless. It's shriveled up from, uh, from atrophy, from lack of uh, blood flow getting to it. Uh, the Greek language, uh, that's what's used in the New Testament, indicates that he wasn't born this way. Here's what the Greek tense indicates. That it was at a point in the past, his hand became withered and was still withered. Okay? The earliest church writer said that he was a stonemason. Uh, this wasn't biblical writers. These were people writing about the Bible. They said he was a stonemason and happened from an accident. We're not sure about that. But, um, so whether it was an accident or it was a disease, whatever is going on, he's lost use of his hand. And it's began to wither, and it's just hanging on the end of his arm. And Jesus says, come here. Come here. And here he finds himself at center stage, right in the center of attention, in the middle of everybody, uh, everybody's gaze there. And all the big wids of religion are sitting there ready to kill Jesus. Just give us one reason. Just do something. Go ahead, heal this guy. And it's funny, Jesus never actually heals the guy. Jesus doesn't touch him. Jesus doesn't tell the guy. He just, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he's playing right on the edge. I mean, Jesus could have done a lot of different things, but he didn't sign up for his own death warrant. You know, he, he, he had some wisdom on here. And so, uh, he also, I, mean, I mean, the thing of it in the legal court, Jesus is like, I just told the guy to come here. I just told the guy to stretch out his hand. Jesus didn't do anything, anything medicinal, no him with oil, anything like that. <clears throat> then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. I want you to think about this. Stretch out your hand. Like, I'm sure his brain had told his hand many times to, uh, to stretch out, but it didn't work. And so the signal starts in the brain. It goes down the nerve endings. But somehow when it got to the hand, it was dead. The, the, nerve, the, the, the nerve impulses, the message from the brain, they didn't get any past there. And this guy knows this. Like, I've told my hand to do it many times. It doesn't work. I can't do it, right? This is like Jesus telling paralyzed people to get up and walk. They can't do it. So what is going on here? It's an act of faith. Get this, get this phrase in your heart. Faith needs an activity. Faith needs an activity. Not trying to do it, but making the effort to do what you can't do because you've heard the word of the Lord. Okay, let's read it again. Matthew 12, 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. Notice it doesn't say, his hand was restored, and then he stretched it out. That's what most believers are waiting for. They're waiting for something to feel better, something to happen, and then they'll act on it, right? It does not say that. It says, Jesus commanded him to stretch it out. Faith comes by hearing. He hears the command of the Lord. The man hears the word of Jesus. There's power in the words of Jesus. But it was necessary for that man to make this act before he came to the end of his ability and met the power of God at the end of his ability. Are you seeing that? He went to stretch out his hand. He can't do that. When he came to the end of his ability, he met God's ability, and it came open. So many people think, Lord, heal me, 
and then I'll get out of this wheelchair. Restore my hand, then I'll stretch it out. That's not how it works. That's not faith. Anybody can respond after you see something, after you feel something. What does the Bible say? We walk by faith and not by sight. He told the man, stretch out your hand. And the man must have believed it. That's why it's in the book here, right? I wonder, how many times did this guy try that before? Um, before that day with Jesus. I'm, I'm sure he tried, who knows, countless times, but today's different. Why? Because he's got a word from the Lord. He made the effort to stretch out his hand, and he's expecting it to be different this time. All those other times, he puts this history, all the disappointments, all the, all the things that have been said about him, and what did he do? This man did what he couldn't do. Faith needs an activity. You need to do what you couldn't do in the act of faith. And in that act of faith, the healing comes. I'm telling you something right here. God's command on the lips of a human being, when they command it in the name of Jesus, there's an ability in the command. The word uh, in the New Testament is dunamis. It means the active power of God. Okay, So when he uh, reached the end of his ability to obey the command, he met the power of God in that. The power of God did not manifest until he was at the end of what he could do. Guys, this is how it's always worked, and this is how it always will work. Faith needs an activity, okay? You have to believe and then receive. I'm telling you, most Christians are trying to do it backwards. They're waiting to receive, waiting to feel better, waiting for their hand to open up, waiting for their legs to be able to move before they get up. Jesus says to Peter, step out of the boat. Peter knew he did not have the ability to walk on water, but he acted on that word, and then when he came to the end of his ability, he met the power of God. He didn't wait until something happened, He acted and connected with the power of God, and then it happened. Feeding of 5,000. Jesus is like, hey, here's a piece of, a little tiny piece of pita bread, here's some fish. And as they gave it out, the power of God was activated. They didn't wait, and then they had a mountain of food. They're like, this is awesome. Let's go feed the people. Didn't look like anything was happening. But as they acted on the word of Jesus, the miracle began to manifest. Like, I know you just put water in the jug. But now what I want you to do is go and show it to the host, and when they taste it, they're going to testify that it's the best vintage wine they've ever had. They didn't go, oh, there's wine in these things. Let's go over to the gym. Water, took it over there. Somehow the miracle happened in that transference. Are you guys getting the picture? Although the word faith isn't used, that's what this man did. So let's just get practical with this. When you're praying for somebody, uh, something that we do around here is we say, check it out. Do something that you couldn't do. Stretch out your hand. Take up your mat. So um, I, another one is um, Luke 17, 4. When Jesus said to them, go and show you, this is the 10 lepers, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. They weren't standing there cleansed. And now they're going to go show themselves to the priest. As they went to show themselves to the priest that they were healed, even though they weren't healed, they became healed. And so when you receive prayer, Try and do something you couldn't do with an expectation that this time is different because now I'm tuned in to the fact that God loves me more than sheep. He loves me more than Jim loves Ellie, his dog, more than you love your canary, whatever it might be. I was going to say cats, but I just can't get there in my mind. I just can't get there with cats. Amen. So I remember, I said, yeah, you guys have heard me say it. There's only one lion in heaven. Or there's only one cat in heaven. And he's a lion. And so... So I remember we were at this church in Springfield, Ohio, and we were doing a healing service there. And I said, hey, if there's anybody, uh, you're hearing this message, and you're like, hey, today's the day for me. I'm going to get healed. I said, come on up here. And so this girl came up there, and she had a, a boot on, like a, like a medical boot. I thought, oh, God, not a boot. I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, my faith wasn't like, yeah, a boot. I was like, oh, boy. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And so, uh, so we prayed for her, and I said, check it out. And so... You know, like do something you couldn't do. So I'm ima- like, she came up limping, so I'm imagining her testing it out. So uh, I didn't know that she was a dancer at the church, like a worship dancer. And uh, she begins running and twirling. Oh, no, she had a broken foot. That's what she had a broken foot. And so she begins running and twirling on this broken foot. So she goes around the whole, the whole sanctuary. So faith comes in the room. Finally, faith comes into my heart. I didn't have any. I'm like, oh, thank God. You know, I would have looked, you know, anyway. And so the next guy, I said, um, I, th- I think he had something going on with his back. And uh, we prayed for him. I said, what can you do? He's like, I want to dunk. And he runs and he jumps on stage with this incredible vertical leap and he's healed. And um, yeah, what do they do? They acted on their faith. 
They did something they couldn't do. And so as a matter of practicality when you're praying for people, don't tell them to do something that you have faith for. Let them decide. I would have never said, go dance on your broken foot. I would have been like, gently put maybe two ounces of pressure, then maybe, you know, in another week, maybe four ounces of pressure, you know. That's, that's good. <laughs> don't let them live up to your faith or down to your faith. My faith was way lower than what they had. Sometimes it might be higher and they might do something to show they have faith and they end up hurting themselves. We've got to steward people and we allow them. Check it out. So sometimes we pray for people, even say, hey, just go do something. Like, like, like check it, do something you couldn't do. Just get out, in the, um, get out in the aisle and walk. And as they begin to do it, it's like, man, my shoulder's actually better. My hips get, my hip, it's in that act of doing it. I remember we were up in Defiance, Ohio, doing healing service. And there was a little boy that had a line of people get, to get prayer. And there was a little boy, and he was standing there crying, and he had on a, a boot. Huh? What's, up, what's up with boots here today? And he had on a, a boot, and he's standing there crying. And I noticed him. So I, I, I kind of skipped everybody, and I just went to him. I said, what's going on? He's like, well, I got this, you know, whatever he did with his foot. And I said, well, let's pray for you first, because he, he was in so much pain he couldn't even stand up. And I said, I said hey, um, check it out. Do what, do what you couldn't do. Again, two ounces of pressure day one, you know, four ounces of pressure one week later. That's what I'm picturing. He began stomping his foot. I thought, lawsuit. <laughs> lawsuit. He began stomping his foot. He's totally healed. Rips off the cast. Oh, no, it was a, it was a cast. because Yeah, it wasn't a boot. It was a cast. And so uh, he rips off the, the plastic cast and begins stomping his foot running around the church. I did not have faith for that. I don't want you to hear that and think, that's what faith looks like. I've got to do that. Okay? What's in your heart? Check it out. And when you come to the end of your ability, you meet God. Faith first, then action. It's not action and then faith. If there's fire in the fireplace, there'll be smoke in the chimney. If there's faith in your heart, there'll be the healing power of Jesus. So don't think, I've got to do something to show God that I'm healed. No, no, no. It's faith first, then activity. Not activity, and then faith. Well, Jim, how do you know? Just go for it and try something. Just don't hurt yourself. But like, expect great things. What, what, are, you, what are you imagining when you're, when you're being healed? Imagine the compassion of God. Like if you've ever had that hurt pet with burrs, if you've ever had a child who's been hurting, if you've ever had a friend, that you've held their hand in the hospital, and you felt that compassion, just know, God is feeling that one million times more for me. He hates that his shepherds have said that, they, that you cannot heal. And so he modeled it, and he pulled those sheep out. He feeds the birds. He takes care of you. How are we doing? So faith is when I dare to believe that God doesn't just maybe, sort of, perhaps want me, want me well, but in a holy, beautiful anger, he reaches out to heal me. Angry that a human being could be afflicted, and love says, says it shall be no more. Stretch out your hand. Take up your mat. Little girl, wake up. Go show yourselves to the priest. And holy love meets holy anger. And faith is birthed out of knowing God's desires for you. Some of you are just beginning to realize how far from, uh, how far from believing that you've already, from not believing you've already moved. It's like, you know what? You had all these doubts. And uh, man, after all these weeks, it's starting to go, you know what? He's good. And, uh, and you're starting to realize uh, you can do this. Some of you, you're having your minds renewed because you're actually noticing sick people and you never even noticed them before. Now you go to the store and you're like, oh my goodness, should I pray for that person? And so even if you don't pray, I want to celebrate the good news. You're already being changed because your mind's being renewed because you're noticing people differently. And so with this aggressive love, let me say this to you. God wants you well. God's already said yes to healing. We're not trying to get God to heal. We're not trying to get God's power to come out of heaven. God's power already came out of heaven in the person of Jesus. So faith is responding to what God's already done. Faith is not opening the hand of God. God's hand has been open for 2,000 years since the cross. He's got a big yes over your life. All of God's promises are yes and amen. It's a yes from the God side. The amen comes from when we turn and we face Jesus and we say, so be it unto me. Let's stand for closing prayer. I want to pray for two things. I want to pray that we receive that heart of God where that holy love meets holy anger for yourself. I would imagine everybody in here, you've got some kind of need, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, financial, you've got something. And um, I want you to just catch that, the heart of God, that man, 
If your life is in a ditch, physically, emotionally, whatever it is, listen, if you'd pull a sheep out of a ditch, if you would help your kid out of a hornet's nest or a yellow jacket's nest, if you would help your dog out of a burr field, if you would, I want you guys to get this. God's like, this is how I feel about you. Not only does he want to do it, he's already done it. He's already paid for it. And so maybe just put your hand in your heart. Holy Spirit, we pray for the heart of God, the love of God to be shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Let these analogies go down deep and hit us at an emotional level, at a faith level, where we see how committed you are to us. That holy love meets holy anger, that anger against sin, that it should not be this way. And so, Lord, we just ask you to reveal that to us. And with that in mind, if you've got a part of your body that needs healing, I'm going to ask you to just put your hand in the body part. Step into the love of God. Just enjoy him. The pressure's off. We're just practicing here. This is a training center. But just enjoy the love of God. See him as that good shepherd. (laughs) And you're that sheep, and he would pull you out of that ditch. He would leave the 99 to come get you. Make it personal. He loves you. And so in the name of Jesus, be made whole. Just confess it over yourself. I am made whole in the name of Jesus. All right. Now take a second. Do what you couldn't do. I know sometimes, uh, you know, if you got like diabetes or something like that, you're going to have to, you know, do something different. But check it out and uh, expect something good. And if something good doesn't happen immediately, just keep turning your eyes to Jesus this week. Okay. And something good will happen. Our healing teams will be willing to pray for you. And let me just get, this was from a couple weeks ago. I don't remember what it was, but I got this picture of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, was, it, was from, it was from one of the verb tenses that we were studying. And I, I forgot to share it in there. But I want you to get this picture of the Holy Spirit uh, like a horse at the gate ready to do miracles at any moment. This is how the Holy Spirit is living. He's not up there like, ah, church again, Sunday morning. <laughs> Could have been watching the game. Could have been skiing. No, no, he's like, he is ready to bring heaven to earth through you. This is what's living on the inside of you. He's not up in heaven doing this. This is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, just waiting for you to come into alignment and say, be made whole. Stretch out your hand. This is who he's making you to be. This is who he's making our church to be. There's lots of lights in Columbus, and we're one of them. And so uh, this, is, this is the heart of God. Jesus, I bless your people to be the most dangerous people in Columbus, Ohio. I thank you that you're, they are bringing heaven to earth, that they're shifting atmospheres with the very presence of God that they're stewarding. That, God, you are winning over our hearts and loving us so much we can't even hold on to our sickness any longer. And so we just say, we give up. Just say that, God, I give up. I can't handle that. I can't hold on to this sickness anymore. You love me too much. And so, God, we just let go with these things. We let you pull us out of the ditch. And anyone listening to this online or on replay, I just say this to you. Be made whole in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our ministry teams are coming forward. They'll be uh, the ones uh, ready to pray. Do you have something, Sean? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sean's just going to finish something. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Our ministry teams are coming forward. They'll be the ones uh, um, with tags on, ready to pray. And Sean's going to share something real quick. Uh, I don't know if any of them on. Oh, it's on. Uh, hey, we wanted to just remind you. Teams, come on forward. Um, next Sunday, we don't have church. Just want to make sure that you got that. We actually have church next Saturday morning at 10 a.m. It's an abbreviated service. You want to come here right on time. It's going to be awesome. There's some kids dynamics going to be involved in it. It's a family service. So that's our Christmas service, but it's on Christmas Eve. Does that make sense? So just kind of want to underline that real quick. 10 a.m. next Saturday. Be here. And it's also really quickly year end. So that means that there's only about 10, 12 more days of giving. If you want to get any more year end tax deductible gifts in for the Normandy project, Project or for the church, the best way to do that is next sun, next Saturday, come in or use the app. The app is available 24-7. You just have to do it by 1231 